This is Ship It with Justin Garrison and Autumn Nash, a podcast about everything that happens after Get Push. Ship It is brought to you by Fly.io, the home of changelog.com. Launch your apps close to your users all around the world. Learn how at fly.io. What's up, nerds? I'm here with Kurt Mackey, co-founder and CEO of Fly. You know we love Fly. So, Kurt, I want to talk to you about the magic of the cloud. <laughs> you have thoughts on this, right? Right. I think it's valuable to understand the magic behind the cloud because you can build better features for users, basically, if you understand that. You can do a lot of stuff, particularly now that people are doing LLM stuff, but you can do a lot of stuff if you get that and can be creative with it. So when you say clouds aren't magic because you're building a public cloud for developers and you go on to explain exactly how it works. What does that mean to you? In some ways it means these all came from somewhere. Like there was a simpler time before clouds where we'd get a server at Rack Shack and we'd SSH it or Telnet into it even and put files somewhere and run the web servers ourselves to serve them up to users. Clouds are not magic on top of that. They're just more complicated ways of doing those same things in a way that meets the needs of a lot of people instead of just one. One of the things I think that people miss out on, and a lot of this is actually because AWS and GCP have created such big black box abstractions. Like Lambda is really black boxy. You can't like pick apart Lambda and see how it works from the outside. You have to sort of just use what's there. But the reality is like Lambda is not all that complicated. It's just a modern way to launch little VMs and serve some requests from them and let them like kind of pause and resume and free up like physical compute time. The interesting thing about understanding how clouds work is it lets you build kind of features for your users you never would expect it. And our canonical version of this for us is that like when we looked at how we wanted to isolate user code, we decided to just expose this machines concept, which is a much lower level abstraction than Lambda that you could use to build Lambda on top of. And what machines are is just these VMs that are designed to start really fast or designed to stop and then restart really fast or designed to suspend sort of like your laptop does when it closes and resume really fast when you tell them to. And what we found is that giving people those primitives actually, there's like new apps being built that couldn't be built before, specifically because we went so low level and made such a a minimal abstraction on top of generally like Linux kernel features. A lot of our platform is actually just exposing a nice UX around Linux kernel features, which I think is is kind of interesting. But like you still need to understand what they're doing to get the most use out of them. Very cool. Okay, so experience the magic of Fly and get told the secrets of Fly because that's what they want you to do. They want to share all the secrets behind the magic of the Fly cloud, the cloud for productive developers, the cloud for developers who ship. Learn more and get started for free at fly.io. Again, fly.io. Hello and welcome to Ship It, the podcast all about what happens after you get push. I'm your host, Justin Garrison, and with me as always is Autumn Nash. How's it going, Autumn? Hey, everyone. I feel like we haven't recorded for a couple of weeks, even though the show has been regular. We got ahead a little bit, and now we have a couple episodes that we're we're catching up on, which is great because like we haven't actually, you and I haven't talked on video for a couple of weeks. I got puked on, and then I had to give Grace like <laughs> hopper <happens>. talk. <laughs> <laughs> and and that actually brings up a great point. So this episode is is going out uh, the week of October twenty first. If you're listening to this. While it goes out, I think it goes out on the 25th. Um, Autumn, you're going to be at uh, GitHub Universe. I'll be at GitHub Universe. Yeah, the following the next, week. Yeah. You're giving a talk over there. What's your talk on? Women and data are important to the future of AI. Well, I'm writing talks for scale while like doing this talk. And then I just did one at Grace Hopper and they're all like married in my brain right now. Yeah. <laughs> and you, totally, you, you like buried the So I'm going to be at All Things Open that same week. Uh, I'm giving a talk there about what I why I was wrong about the cloud. Um, and, and I have a lot of opinions that I've learned over the years. The fact that they haven't tried to take you out yet. Just like it just that you are like 
I, just, I might be doing my talk behind <laughs> some some shields or something. Like, I'm going to get you one of those vests just to keep you safe. <laughs> <laughs> but you also mentioned scale, which the CFP for scale closes on November 1st. So anyone that is looking to give a talk at a conference, please submit one to the Southern California Linux Expo. I've given, I think, four talks over... 15 years going there. You give like two at once half the time. It is the best first beginner conference because the vibe is just so community driven and there's such a variety of topics. If you want to come to Pasadena in March, great weather. Autumn will show you where to get some tacos. And uh, <laughs> honestly, though, like if you have to pick one conference next year, scale is like nerd summer camp or like spring break camp. For like the coolest people in open source and DevOps and Kubernetes, like I'm still never going to run anything in Kubernetes after the way that like y'all made talks <laughs> last year, like you scared me to death, but the coolest people like in really kind people and community driven. And it's not like super fancy, like a lot of uh, conferences, but the people and the people working on cool stuff that you probably use with open source being what 70% of infrastructure, like the people that you'll meet have worked on really influential things, but somehow they remain like the kindest, most humble people, really yeah. cool people. And like it's family friendly. I know I'm bringing, uh, I'll probably bring my son at least one of the days on. You'll probably bring some of your kids. Uh, I'm bringing all of them. <laughs> they want to give talks and everything, but then I'm dropping them off at their dads. Yeah. So like we can do hood rat <laughs> stuff together. <laughs> And the whole conference is is pretty cheap. It's community driven, so it's not like big budget thousand dollar tickets. I think the tickets last year were like one hundred and twenty bucks. If you have a student discount, I went as a student when I worked at a university, and so they were fifty percent off. I think they were like thirty bucks at the time when I went. I think now they're maybe sixty. Um, so definitely check it out if you're interested in submitting a CFP. I'm actually doing a live stream with them because I help organize it. So November first, if you're listening to this ahead of time, go look at the Scale YouTube. We have a live stream on just like feedback for CFPs because we want to get new speakers. We love getting people that are first time speakers. If you are working on something interesting or found something cool in technology, submit a talk proposal and, and it might be a great fit. It might not, but either way you can check it out. So there's a kids track too. Yes. And like, it's one of the most, yeah. it's also one of the most diverse, like speaking, like there's so many women, there's so many people from all over different companies, big companies, small companies, and the amount that you learn about what big companies and different people like contribute to open source. Like I did not know that Meta and so many people like committed to so much to open source until going and listening to them talk. And the talks are like real, like about things, but like a very, um, they're not trying to sell you things, right? Because it's not a big conference. So they're like very real life. It's not company sponsored. It's not, it's just like, yes. hey, I showed up. So it's, about. The talks are so good. And I like, I was sitting there and people were walking around with their babies. And I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. Like I met like women founders with their babies in their hands. And I was like, this is my people. Like, <laughs> I love it. So that's enough selling of, of things that we're talking about. This conversation, uh, Pete Naylor's on the show. And, and Pete, you're a product manager at Enterprise DB. We've been looking forward to this. I, I've been looking forward to this for a while. This is the first time we met. I know we rescheduled this show once already. Autumn keeps hyping you up like nonstop. Wait, 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 <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Pete is one of my favorite people that I've met in my entire career. Like I, this man was like, okay, when you get thrown into being a specialist SA and everyone else has been doing stuff since like before you were born, <laughs> he was like the nicest, kindest person, but he's also one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever met. Like he's been a what DBA, you've worked on hardware and data centers. He's been a solutions architect. He's been in product. He's done all the things, but still is like humble and one of the kindest people you'll ever met, meet. Like you can meet people that know Pete and in two seconds, they're saying the same exact thing about, and then you're both like, I met someone like randomly and we were like, do you know Pete Naylor? And we were like, fangirling and having the same moment and you would have like we were saying the same thing back to each other like <laughs> he is one of the kindest people oh man that's quite the introduction now i, I think maybe people are getting the impression that i probably started in uh, in the computing industry in about 1873 <laughs> been everywhere <laughs> kind of done everything <laughs> you know that, that sounds like uh, one of those job descriptions where they want someone to have uh, 20 years with uh, kubernetes or something right yeah I went yeah. to a job interview and they were like, we want you to have 20 years experience of Postgres and then like this other database and this. And I was like, Pete's the only person that has <laughs> <laughs> Like, I know the person you are. 
and it's not me because <laughs> like you you can't see this because I think this is just going to be an audio only thing. But I have a lot of gray in my beard, and uh, there wasn't so much of that before I started at Amazon. By the way, but- <laughs> I'm taking pictures. Like we have to have a reunion of like essay like reunion moment but do, pete also does like the craziest outdoor stuff he's like a wildlife rescue like volunteer <laughs> you are a firefighter like what have you not done <laughs> like, uh really? let's see i never went hang gliding that's on my it's on my list i really how have you not been me. hang gliding because you do like I look i go outside through pete's like linkedin and twitter pictures because like, <laughs> <laughs> they're always like I went to a surprise birthday party at, at this place that was um, on acreage, kind of a farm in a barn once. And um, I was hanging out out there drinking a beer and these guys flew in on hang gliders and landed out in the field behind. And I went over to talk to them and like they had, I had no idea. I thought hang gliding was like jumping off a thing and, you know, 20 minutes later you're on the ground. These guys have been up there for six hours. They had, yeah. what? They had you can icicles in their beards yeah, and they'd yeah. been all through the cascades. And I was like, Okay, I've got to do that. How have you not figured out how to do this by now? Because I feel like that is so up your alley. <laughs> I might be a little bit scared, but yeah. <laughs> all the things that like are too outsidey and give me anxiety, Pete. That's Pete's hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pete, how did you get started in tech? What were you doing at the time, and kind of like what what drove you into it? Uh so yeah, like I said, back in 1873, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually. So I grew up in a little little mining town in the middle of nowhere in Australia, and I went off to Brisbane to go to university, and uh, I ended up studying. I, I had this opportunity to do a dual degree because I had gone to Japan as an exchange student, just got back, and had to figure out what course I was going to take. And they offered me this dual degree where I could do mechanical engineering and Japanese language. So uh, I went for it, and I really liked a lot of it, but I kind of didn't really like the university experience. I kind of felt like I, the whole time I was like, I want to get out there and actually have a career and make some money, right? <laughs> Which now I look back and I think I should have kind of enjoyed that. Why didn't I get it? Because I had all these friends that, you know, traveled the world and worked on, uh, you know, running lifts at ski areas and they just hopped back and forth from the Northern Hemisphere to the Southern Hemisphere. I didn't really do that. Started on a career. But while I was at university, you know, we had these CAD CAM systems that were on Sun Microsystems boxes and things like this. <laughs> so I I kind of started getting into computing already and I like BBSs and getting this open source software and stuff. But when I got to university and I, I got introduced to to some of these Unix operating systems and some of the really nice hardware and then the internet. Like the internet was super, super early stage at this point. It was like early 90s. Now you all know how old I really am. Um, and so it was things like Usenet News and IRC and email and FTP to get software and stuff like that and very early days of, of um, the web, right? So it was like, it's like, uh, Netscape for version 0.9 and we had all of the old uh, very old web servers and it was a super cool time because it was like all of this information was out there and hadn't commercialized yet but I got really enthusiastic about learning about Unix operating systems and and, um, and the internet and so this is a long story I know but I but you yeah, were still in Australia at the time still in right? Australia still in Australia how did that like because like my rec- like, I don't know how the internet spread. I, I was not in technology at the time, and I came to it much later in life. And how did that kind of spread across the world from what was, you know, like this, a virus? This- you know, <laughs> people got on planes and carried it with them, and took it to other places. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, there were there were these uh, like at, at a university level, it was ARPANET. There were all these uh, uh, connected universities around the world that were exchanging information, and it, it kind of grew out of that. Um, so it was it was a lot less commercialized, a lot less compelling, and and but it was super cool to me. I just I just really wanted to dig into that, and and of course, um, I spent a lot of nights staying up very late trying to figure out how to run Unix stuff and and learn this stuff, and and um, I just reached this point where I was like, I don't know about this mechanical engineering thing. It seemed kind of cool <laughs> at the time, but I'm I'm way too distracted and more interested in this other stuff. And um, I actually had a a friend that went to a university in Sydney that I'd kind of been emailing and, and, and it was like pen pals back then, but he introduced me to this, the woman that was in the U S and we kind of ended up exchanging emails. So 
we met online, which I, you know, I tell people that now and, and they think of dating.com or something like it was nothing like that at all. But <laughs> that is so adorable. We exchanged emails for a while and did the IRC thing and chattered. And, and then uh, I had a university break, like the summer break or whatever. And um, I decided, well, I'm going to go there and, and, you know, meet this person and, and hang out and get to see the U.S. And in fact, she paid for my flight, which was a big part of it because I was broke. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, once we actually meet in person, that's probably going to go out the window. That's going to go badly, but <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to miss like a chance to go to the U S and, and see something different. So off I went and I discovered that I kind of liked it a lot. And so I packed up my stuff. I went to the U S I stayed there and, um, I ended up starting a little business where I was providing dial up internet service in this little tiny rural community. So I was building all of these services and helping people get online. And um, I was reminded of something uh, just the other day. I was talking to someone about whether you're screen sharing something, right? I think I was on a call or something, and I thought people were seeing what I was seeing on my screen, and I'd <laughs> forgotten to share. But I always remember people like at that point were trying to dial in. They'd have trouble or something, and they'd call, and they'd want help. And I was trying to do um, support, and they would get frustrated with me because it was like, what? you can't see what's on my screen? And I'm like, nope, you're not connected for one thing. <laughs> like, but yeah, so I stayed in the US and I just got more and more involved in that. All of the internet stuff kind of consolidated. There was a lot of smaller companies, a lot of ISPs that were out there and the big companies were kind of sucking all of that up. And I actually, the company that we had our, uh, our uplink through, they had an open position for a systems admin. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll go work for them. And that company was called Northwest Net. They actually spun out of the University of Washington um, because it was becoming clear that companies like Boeing and Microsoft and everybody were were wanting to connect to this thing and, and make use of it. And the university couldn't do it as a nonprofit. So they kind of spun it out and many, many really, really cool people there at a, a very foundational time for me. There were people there that I worked with that like wrote the RFCs for DNS, right? And, and these kinds of things. Super cool time. So when you came to the US, did you come to Washington and you've been in Washington the whole time? Same place the whole time. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know you've been here the whole time. That's really cool. Yeah, I hardly moved around. I feel like that's pretty boring. I should mix it up a little bit. <laughs> I've traveled no, across it's... Yeah, I traveled across a fair bit of the US and and I love it because there's there's a longer history here and a lot of different culture. I feel like in Australia, you know, it's it's kind of like you can leave Queensland and go to New South Wales, but people have the same accent. <laughs> and it's like they eat the same stuff. Everybody eats Vegemite, you know. So um, in the U.S., you can you can travel. You can go to New Orleans or, or some of these places, and, and there's so much variety. Yeah. You don't have to go out overseas to really uh, get a different experience, right? That so. is really cool. That's true. So where did firefighting come into all this? <laughs> like um, so at some point I was still doing all my regular full-time stuff in IT and technology. And, um, I actually had a neighbor that he was into fishing and diving and all of those kinds of things. And he talked me into going out cause I had my own little boat at the time. He saw me on the driveway and he was like, we need someone to run the boat when I go diving. You want to, you want to come out and do that? <laughs> so I was sitting on the boat and the very first time, by the way, when you're the last person on the boat, everybody jumps in the water and, and like. There's just a few bubbles and that's all you see for 40 minutes. It's really eerie. You're like, this is, <laughs> yeah. this is not natural, right? This can't work out well. But yeah, I did that. I got really interested in the diving and, and that buddy of mine, um, he was an emergency room physician uh, for a long time and I kind of got involved in emergency response. And because he was a diver, he helped out with uh, the local dive rescue program, volunteer program. I say rescue because... Once you get into it, you realize there's not very many rescues in in, mm. in the diving thing. It's mostly recoveries. But um, so he talked me into the learning to dive and getting involved there, and then that led to you know being given a chance to become an EMT and get the training for free. Once I got that EMT credential, I was kind of near the end of the course, and they were like, "Wait a minute, you're not part of a fire department. Like you're never going to get to use this stuff." When you're in search and rescue, you're not going to get to like do CPR very often or anything. He said, you should, you should think about joining a volunteer fire department. So I did that. 
I also got into mountain rescue, which was really, really cool. Um, you have no regular hobbies. Like your hobbies are all like the most like extreme. Like um, like, do you just ever sit down ever? <laughs> I <laughs> like, do more and more. I sit down. I take I take naps often now. I'm fine. Yes, all right. It's back to the gray beard and starting out in 1873. Yeah. The, with the way that you do activities and work, I think you deserve the naps. Like, <laughs> I don't. I don't deserve my naps. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> You take naps because you refuse to drink coffee. What is wrong with you? I think, yeah, I don't know what it is about me. I, I, I always feel like life is short. I, I um, When I was a kid, I actually lost an older sister. And I think maybe that's part of what makes me think, you know, you don't get that many chances. And I want to fit in like as much variety and, and like meaningful things in my life. So, And somewhere along those life decisions, you decided to do databases. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was all Amazon actually. Well, like I worked at these companies and it was mostly about uh, systems admin stuff. I've never been a developer. Right? A lot of my stuff that I used to do was, was building packages for uh, automated installation on all of these servers. They were mostly C. Um, there was also a lot of Perl at the time and yeah. Perl drove me nuts. I, I hated it because it was like, <laughs> we couldn't just have something that was prepackaged because of our policies. We had to build everything separately. And then the developers loved Perl because it was so nice, but then they would like, Oh, there's like hundreds of modules that I can add. And every one of those modules I had to package separately oh. and, and build. And it's like, it's brutal. But, and this is what the nineties or two thousands, were you doing like spec files? What was this? 90s and, and early 2000s. Um, okay. So that, that company... This is just TARS. Yeah, a lot of TARS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unpackaging things, running the builds, make files. Um, yeah. Okay, friends. I'm here with a new friend of ours over at Timescale Avthar. So within... So Avthar, help me understand what exactly is Timescale? So Timescale is a Postgres company. We build tools in the cloud and in the open source ecosystem that allow developers to do more with Postgres. So using it for things like time series, analytics, and more recently, AI applications like RAG and search and agents. Okay, if our listeners were trying to get started with Postgres, Timescale, AI application development, what would you tell them? What's a good roadmap? If you're a developer out there, you're either getting tasked with building an AI application or you're interested in you're seeing all the innovation going on in the space and want to get involved yourself. And the good news is that any developer today can become an AI engineer using tools that they already know and love. And so the work that we've been doing at Timescale with the PGAI project is allowing developers to build AI applications with the tools and with the database that they already know, and that being Postgres. What this means is that you can actually level up your career, you can build new interesting projects, you can add more skills without learning a whole new set of technologies. And the best part is it's all open source, both PGAI and PG Vector Scale are open source. You can go and spin it up on your local machine via Docker, follow one of the tutorials on the Timescale blog, build these uh, cutting edge applications like RAG and such without having to learn 10 different new technologies and just using Postgres and the SQL query language that you will probably already know and are familiar with. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Get started today. Uh, it's a PGAI project and just go to any of the Timescale GitHub repos, uh, either the PGAI one or the PG Vector Scale one and follow one of the tutorials to get started with becoming an AI engineer just using Postgres. Okay, just use Postgres and just use Postgres to get started with AI development, build RAG, search, AI agents, and it's all open source. Go to timescale.com slash AI, play with PG AI, play with PG Vector Scale, all locally on your desktop. It's open source. Once again, timescale.com slash AI. How'd you get into like Dynamo and like all the different NoSQL and all that? Because Pete's really like really, really good with all of that. But Pete has got that. Pete won't bullshit you. Like, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people will be like, I sell this thing and I'm just going to say it is the best thing ever. Pete will keep it real. Like I still have that little bit of like where I grew up in Australia. That's why I love you though. <laughs> <laughs> 
like my hometown, there is no cooth, right? There is no nobody holds anything back. Like Look, we were in the room with some of the most like popular ish like database nerds of like all of the tech people and a lot of people are scared to like disagree with people sometimes you know and like they'll be like well this person's so good at this and they invented all these things pete will be like look here <laughs> like, that's not true and i'm just like oh he's my hero <laughs> like, so i you know I, I developed through that my my company got bought out and all of the, that stuff happened and, and eventually it was like vario i don't know if anybody remembers them but they were this company that bought up 50 of the most successful ISPs all around the US. And when they did that, they were like, well, we got to like move all of the email and glom everything and centralize stuff. And they, they kind of cherry picked like a dozen engineers, like sysadmins from across all of those companies. And they said, you're going to travel around and you're going to glom all of this together and migrate everything. So this was the beginning of my migrations stuff. Mm -hmm. Autumn, that, that never ended. It seems like you're always <laughs> migrating something. And stuff, right. I think that's just like the cycle. So I did that. And, and eventually I kind of got into these roles where I was managing and looking after teams. And a lot of the folks that I supported were DBAs, right? When you're running the sysadmin stuff, there's usually when things went wrong, the, there was a lot of finger pointing. It's like, no, it's the network. And you point to the network engineers and no, no, that's not it. Everything's fine. Oh, it's the disks. It's the operating system. And, you know, so I got to work pretty closely with them, also with developers and got to know a lot of the challenges there. When I joined AWS, I actually applied as a, a TAM, so a technical account manager. And at AWS, that's part of the enterprise support org. And when I joined, it was like in my first week, they took me aside and they were like, well, we're going to assign you your customer and your customer is going to be Amazon.com, right? Oh, so, <laughs> so, yeah. Like, oh, man. <laughs> like, yeah, I was like, I don't know what this really means. It sounds kind of cool. It could be fun. And then I started telling some of the other Tams about it, and their eyes were like, oh, man, you're in for a ride. <laughs> oh, like, no. it's going to be crazy because they're just a huge, huge customer and very, very demanding. And they didn't have to use any of the regular process, right? They would just yeah. look up phone tool, call up the principal engineer on DynamoDB, right, and harass them with their DynamoDB questions. But yeah, I started in that role and there was a sm very small team of us that did grow over time. Um, and we had to teach all of those internal teams to like, please use enterprise support because this is the only way this can scale. And for anyone that's not familiar with like how that relationship works, right? Like Amazon, the company has AWS and Amazon.com uses AWS as kind of an, a customer, like where it's, it is, it is billed, they use the services um, and there are supposed to go through some sort of support channels for standard things, but it's yeah. the largest, most important customer to many regards. So um, they get some special treatment. Kind of overwhelming to, to work with them and support them, but it was also really cool. Like they were really pushing a lot of the AWS services harder than than most of the other uh, customers right so we got to be involved in things where you know there were some sharp edges in dynamo db for example right and and when we could go and describe like this is not working for our customer it really improved all of those products so it was it was cool to be a part of but very very stressful intense none of the tooling that was there that all of the other tams used to support their customers none of them would work for us <laughs> like they just yeah. they didn't scale they would fall over so yeah i worked on that and and there were so to your point about Amazon using AWS, it's like I think a lot of people when they think about Amazon, it's like, oh, they they were born in the cloud, right? They've no. been there for the beginning. <laughs> no. And and at this point, they were still doing things where, you know, they would kind of share data centers and they would rack stuff up. But for example, like on a prime day, these teams would, would go on and, and choose really basic bare metal stuff and have it racked up. And that's how they were scaling a lot of stuff. Yeah. But they had these two really big initiatives at the time that they wanted to work on. One was um, just about adopting cloud in general, so going to EC2 and getting out of that kind of stuff. And then the other one was migrating off of Oracle. So, oh, yeah, that was a big one. I think, I think in my first couple of weeks, there had been some major event. One of the teams who had just started using DynamoDB had maybe not figured out how that works and had some hot key things. And it was a, a, a big operational issue and a review of that. And I got sent off to deal with that with no knowledge of, of DynamoDB. <laughs> I had like a, a half hour whiteboard discussion with one of the other TAMs on my team who'd been there a little bit. For context, so going from Oracle, which is a relational, you know, and then going <laughs> to like one of the 
biggest like no sql databases that might not have been the biggest at the time but that's a like just the access pattern and like how you use DynamoDB is very, very, very different than a relational yeah, database. Yeah, there was a lot to teach. And, and you know, for the Amazon teams, it's like you hear about the whole two pizza thing. And that is such a reality that it's painful to try and yeah. to try and move them through something like this. It's like, how do you reach out and get all of those people to know about, you know, we're going to do this session on DynamoDB data modeling. It's like there's there's very little like directives overall that guide people to you know this is what you want we want you to do you kind of get to do your own thing and so it was a constant struggle trying to reach out and get to every one of all of those teams and so there was a lot of stuff it was done by tiers right so anything that was really really critical the kind of stuff that, that jeff would get paged within an hour of a of an impact um that was the tier that all had to go to dynamo db and then there was a little bit lower tier where it could stay on a relational database but it had to be Postgres or something, right? Yeah. Aurora. And then there was the the data warehouse, which is, um, it was also on Oracle. And um, it was literally one of the biggest data warehouses in the world. And so it was kind of a painful thing where if they were going to run into some something that was going to blow up and go wrong, it was them first, right? And no other customer was going to encounter that first. So they were always the ones dealing with the scalability bugs and yeah. things. Not a good place to be. So they had to go to Redshift. And I had to I had to work on all of those different things and support all of those teams. I think the Dynamo DB thing really spoke to me most because of that whole change to the completely serverless model and the scale. Right, it's super cool. I got to go and and do things like sit in the war rooms for Prime Day and help all of those teams trying to plan for scaling. And I think a lot of those teams didn't see the picture of what happened over those that two or three years it's like they very quickly came to take dynamo db for for granted but for me i was like i watched it end to end i was like there's this thing where people are spending six months a year trying to plan and scale and be ready for these events and now like a couple of years later yes it was painful it was hard to get there but now it's literally like dial it up and dial it back down yeah and so i got to see like how much time that gave back to them it was it was pretty cool According to the the announcement when Amazon announced that they had moved off of Oracle officially, uh, which was October 2019, so five years. I'm ago. in that video. You can you see are? me drinking champagne. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. But yeah, it's, yeah, it says there's there were 75 petabytes of data, 7,500 Oracle databases, and moving them to like you said, like all of the different options depending on what the right choice was at the time. Yeah. Which is like why those products are actually like really good managed databases because they tested them out like with that scale of data like you're never you're never going to get scale like that from just random customers like to be able to find the edge cases of your products with those like for one with the requirements that you know and the standards that you have to hold and then with that type of scale that's a great way to make sure you've hardened your products and like have really good databases because it was very cool to be a part of that right and and i think um you know through that process as hard as it was that's where I really dr I drank the Amazon Kool Aid. I loved the LPs, and I like I really got to see some of those processes happen from both sides. Where I would go to meetings where there were a bunch of people on the retail side saying, "Hey, this is not working very well for us," and AWS would try to push back a little bit, and and then ultimately someone would stand up and say, "Like this is not customer obsessed," and everything would change, <laughs> and it would happen. So I really loved that those LPs, I, I really believed in it because I saw it from both sides of the org. They're slightly different cultures, I think, Amazon retail versus AWS. So I just got really sucked into that. I, I loved it and I learned so much. After a lot of that, those programs were kind of wrapping up. Then I had um, some of the, what was beginning to be the specialist, like the global specialist solution architect team, reach out to me and say, hey, do you want to come and be one of the first Dynamo DB specialists globally? And I was like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. So I went and basically worked with all of these other really big companies. You know, we would each get a few of them, a handful that was like, you need to guide these folks through this whole modernization journey and in, and in particular, help them to adopt Dynamo DB. Being a specialist essay is one of the coolest jobs because you get to see all the contrast and like between different databases and it's a, it's the perfect mix of business and technology and seeing how all of that like contrast and watching migrations and seeing like 
when you need to move from like a relation because you have to know all of your competition stuff and then you have to know your like technology really well and how to like compare those and pete is one of the best at it especially with the fact that he knows like so much about relational databases and then you've got like no sequel and just the way that he can compare it he's very very good at his job i tried it like when i first started as an essay i i really liked the idea because i never had like a sales kind of background and i think i'm probably not the right person to have a lot of those discussions <laughs> um because i usually just i really would just want to solve the problem and make it awesome right i don't want to be part of the, the money side of things so much um so I, I really loved that. I, I thought, you know, there's there's actually something we can achieve here that will be meaningful, right? It really move these companies forward. So I did that for a few years, um, had a lot of really great experience there too. And then eventually the product management team, because I, I worked so closely with all of the engineers on DynamoDB and some of the product managers, and I really got to loving some of those folks. I like some amazing amazing engineers within the dynamo db team and it's big numbers like it's it's super cool like i it's i still like i can't really share any of this kind of thing but if people could hear the number of nodes and the number of servers and things that are behind dynamo db it's just absolutely astounding it's an incredible service they create it real magic in real time that's technological magic right there yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> So yeah, I mean that was that that next stage, and then and then product management team kind of reached out to me and said, "Hey, we need another, we need more product managers, and and you know the product so well, you're really well connected, and have you thought about trying product management?" It's kind of like you know you've made that transition recently too, right, Justin? You yeah. Kind of moved into product, and I think at that point I was like, I've seen so many things that customers <laughs> are asking for, and we've asked for them, and the SAs have asked for them before, and it's like. I'm so frustrated that a lot of them are not just getting done. Like, how can this be? And I thought, okay, I can move into this product management role and product managers just get to decide. And it's like, we will make this happen. And I'm just going to go in there and say, we will solve all of the customer problems. But of course, it's harder than that. There's a lot of resource management. There's a lot of figuring out, like reading between the lines on what, what counts and what doesn't. And you know, then there's a lot of organizational constraints too that don't don't allow you to deliver what you would like to deliver. Maybe. What's your favorite job out of all the jobs that you've had? Oh gosh, like maybe that because you've had a lot. The early job at Northwest Net was super cool. Like that that was a relatively small team of super smart people, and it was all groundbreaking work. Yeah, I think that's probably still my favorite. I find it funny for myself, like looking back on like one of the the best roles I had was being a manager of like a, like help desk team, right? Like we were just like frontline support, like, and it's super small scale. When you think about it, it was just like, we're helping people do laptops and printers and whatnot, but like being able to work so well with people, I think makes a, an impact on just how, how much you look fondly on what you did as a team, right? There was nothing I was doing individually. It was like, we as a team worked so well together. And I loved that role when I look back on it, even, even if it wasn't like, I didn't get paid a whole lot. I didn't get notarized. None of that stuff. It's just like, no, like we were just behind the help desk and we just went in and like help people replace the laptops, scan viruses, do that sort of stuff. But it was so, everything worked so well together that we were all learning stuff. We were all pushing each other. And, and that sort of like teamwork I feel is, has been missing in a lot of my other jobs. Yeah. I think people is one of the most important parts of a job, like having good people and working with good people and smart people and getting to like solve problems together is like my favorite thing about tech. Yeah. Ultimately that's, that's how it is for me too. You know, you go through a, a whole career of this and you look back and it's, it's the people, it's the people that made the difference. And I, you know, I think maybe, you know, going back to me wanting to be a, a volunteer firefighter and EMT and doing all of those things I did, it's kind of, to me, it's it's the helping people, right? Making a difference in their lives that's very rewarding, but you don't get there without good teamwork. How do you think that your other like activities, like the rescue and like the helping people part, how do you think that influences like your tech career? I think it makes you much better with people. Like I think a lot of people who are very technical aren't as good with other humans and people and seeing like a customer's pain point as you, but like from your perspective, what do you think like makes you like, how do you think those two relate? I guess. I mean, maybe it's helped me a little bit to, to kind of be patient with people. 
you know, like when you're working with people, you're trying to, you're in a team, it's stressful and it's very easy to forget that everybody has their own problems they're working through. When, when you go, like if you're a firefighter, for example, um, it's, it's a huge honor that like in their worst possible moments, people let you just walk right into their house, right? It really means a lot to be able to have that kind of thing. So maybe seeing people and understanding that, that people are, they're actually all the same, right? You look at people and you think, well, they're a God, right? And can't just talk to them. But every one of those people has the same basic stuff. Everybody's going to go through some rough times and everybody needs a hand up. So, Dude, I have the best Pete story ever. So I was going through ABs, which is like this thing where you get like, it's like the worst essay call you can have, but they like test you to make sure you like survive it, you know? And I went through a bunch and we had this one like super fancy principal fancy person that like put me through one for a test and he made me cry. It was horrible. I wanted to give up. I was like, this is horrible. I'm not good at it. And my next person was Pete. And I show up to this meeting like in tears. I'm ready to quit my job. Like, and it was horrible. And Pete was the sweetest, kindest person. And he was like, it's okay. Like, let's just walk through some of your slides. And he gave me all this advice, like advice I still use in public speaking, like when I give talks like today. And I, he's like, we'll schedule another one for next week. And I was just sitting there like, I'm horrible at this. And like, I give up and like just a puddle. And he was so like, he was there with his dog. It was the sweetest thing ever. <laughs> like, he was so sweet. I think that you bring so much like technological, like know how and like just experience. Like you watch the like internet, like born and you saw it from like where it started to where we are now. But you also bring so much like empathy to tech. And I think that makes you much more different than most people with that same like technological wow you make me feel pretty good but i have to say like i, I, I am one of your biggest fans like <laughs> if there was a pete fan club i'd be the president like you made so much impact on my life and my career you were good people's thank you well I, you know i know when i when i first uh, started working with you i'd heard about this program but it was kind of optional it was like a mass email sent to everybody hey we're trying to like it was the the military spouses program i think right and yeah. i was involved in fire department and doing all that kind of thing and i've always thought you know military families they deserve all the opportunities we can give them because it's it's hard it's a sacrifice you make so i thought yeah i should get involved in that maybe i can help someone i've been around a long time there's the gray beard again. Maybe I have maybe I have some some tips, right, that I can help help someone mentor uh, and mentor them. And I think the first conversation I had with you, I was just really impressed by how driven you were, and also like how much you personally cared about the quality of your work, right, to the point where you cried, right? <laughs> you, Dude, I was. You so really sad. cared. <laughs> you really cared when it when it seemed like you weren't able to get to the level that you wanted to get to. And I thought, well, it's just you just got to be patient and, and stick with it. I, so, and you did. You done really awesome. It was so intimidating being with people that were like they've been doing something for like twenty to forty years, and you're like the new kid. And it was so nice to have like kind people. What's up, friends? I'm here with a good friend of mine, Adam Jacob, co-founder and CEO of System Initiative. And I'm pretty excited to have him here because that means System Initiative is out there. It's GA. Adam, I heard that you launched something. Yeah. Oh, I'm stoked. We did. Yeah, we launched something uh, on the 25th of September. And yeah, you can use System Initiative now by going to a website and signing up and three clicks and you're in. And then you can automate infrastructure. It's sick. It's the coolest thing in the universe. I'm so proud of it. Well, let's level some folks up. Let's level up the Terraform folks, the Pulumi folks, the AWS CDK folks. As of System Initiative being GA, these folks are kind of doing things the old way, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what I hope is true. Okay. <laughs> I think, <laughs> yeah. look, I here's here's what it is. Basically, we figured out that part of the reason that it's so hard for us to achieve the outcomes we're looking to achieve with 
the kind of DevOps and operational work that we do is because the tools we're using sort of help bring about those tough outcomes. It's a lot harder to like write static code, have your friends review it. In System Initiative, what you do is you use this like living architecture diagram to put together all the different relationships between the things that you use. And then you can program that architecture diagram to do all the stuff you need it to do. So like it automatically understands how to do things like, you know, create resources and delete them or update their tags or do those things. But then you can also extend it with your own custom policy. And the whole thing happens in real time in multiplayer. Let's say you're going to like build some infrastructure. You got to go, you know, use an AWS account. You're going to launch a new service. So you got to go set up all the different pieces, the VPCs and the EKS clusters and, you know, ECS and database services. And you got to set up IAM rules. There's all this stuff you got to do. With System Initiative, what'll happen is you'll sign up, you'll get this workspace, and then you'll have this list of all the different architecture assets that AWS provides. And what you'll do is throw those things into this big diagram in the center of the screen, which is basically this living architecture diagram. And then you'll connect them together, just like you you would if you were drawing an architecture. And what it's doing when you do that is actually writing the code to describe how these things work. And it's running it as a simulation. So it's telling you in real time, this would work or this wouldn't. So you don't have to wait. There's no like long feedback loops. We actually vet all of that infrastructure and all that architecture in advance. Then you can say, hey, this looks good. It's what I want to see in the real world. And you can apply that change set. And it's keeping track of all the different things you have to do to actually go make that infrastructure real. And then it goes and does it. And then after it does, it keeps keeps track of those things too. So you can see both sides. You can see the real thing in the world that is what you created and it's and it's attached to the model of what you thought you wanted. And then you can use that to manage it over time. And then when you have customizations or tweaks or things you need to build for yourself, you can go write that directly into the system in real time in these same kind of change sets that you use to do the infrastructure. And so that's what it's like to use System Initiative. It's it's the most powerful, intuitive, collaborative way to do this work that's ever existed. Okay, System Initiative is out there. It is GA and it's the future. Go to systeminit.com. Get started in three clicks. They do have a free tier that means free. No credit card required that you can play with. Again, systeminit.com. That's S-Y-S-T-E-M-I-N-I-T.com. What are you doing now? Like, tell us about your career, like your new company and like what you're doing. So um, I had a year off at a little tiny startup between Amazon because I like by the time I finished up at Amazon, I just thought oh, this is really feeling kind of standard, the you know, standard big corporate America. I wasn't feeling as driven by the LPs anymore, and I so I gave up on that and I went to the direct opposite. I went to a super small, super early stage startup, and it was really scrappy and fun. But um, at the time, it's kind of an unstable time. Right? <laughs> Lots of people were getting laid off from small startups, and that was me and a bunch of other folks. And then I thought, well, I want that perfect like Goldilocks story size company. And I was looking around for a while. I always liked the idea of Postgres, even though I became kind of the Dynamo DB person. I had such a focus on that. I still really loved, uh, you know, a lot of what I saw in those migrations with some of the teams that were moving from. Oracle to Postgres. And I love open source. So I was, I was looking at Postgres and I thought it's a cool open source product. I like the way the community is working. Some of the rough edges around licensing issues and things that have happened for a lot of other uh, projects haven't really happened for Postgres. That's actually true. And it's databases, right? It's databases. So I thought well, I can give that a try. And I was an SA again at the little startup and um, I kind of had both both options in mind. I thought what I wanted to do, but I ended up taking a product role. Yeah, the company I'm at now um, has been around a really long time and, and actually pays uh, many of the engineers that contribute probably most of the, the changes that happen in Postgres. So that's super cool to see. It's a little bit like when I was at AWS and I could literally go drop in on principal engineers and like, ask them about indexing and you could scribble on a whiteboard and learn so much. There's really, really smart folks involved and has a great culture, which is refreshing after feeling very much burned out at, at Amazon. Yeah, that makes sense. Where And, and this is another little shift that I know is uh, going to be interesting for Justin because I've seen some of the things that he's been posting. And, you know, when I was an SA, like while I saw what really worked 
super well for Amazon and for a lot of other bigger companies or whatever. There was always this push to say, well, you know, it's all about being on the cloud and you only need one cloud and all of those kinds of things. And in some ways it was easy to believe, but over time I just, I realized that, you know, no, there, there are like different scenarios, different companies, certain products that when you scale to a certain point, then maybe it's, you know, something you consider running yourself there is this whole other reality around uh, needing to still run things on prem. You know, people need databases on submarines. They're not connected, yeah. <laughs> right? You need to run truly air gapped. So um, there's very real uh, use cases and, and reasons, I think, to still be able to run where you want to. And I just think having flexibility around that is is great. So a lot of the stuff that we're working on at the moment is trying to give people flexibility around um where you actually want to run this stuff right and and have a nice experience that's easy everywhere one of the things that i saw you know at aws was there was dynamo db there was uh, aurora and and some of these things but over the years the number of these purpose-built databases just kept growing and growing it was like it got more and more difficult to try and tease them apart and explain to people like which you should choose You've been in technology long enough to see those like like pendulum swing of just like oh everything should be <laughs> single purpose and and finely tuned to this use case and then swing it back to like actually those could all just be plugins the generic you know general purpose thing over here and like that keeps going back and forth even with you know databases it happens with web servers it happens even with the cloud and data centers right it's like oh we need this one thing and now we need multiple yeah. and then we go back and forth every time absolutely it's kind of like this hype cycle thing it's like once you've been around it long enough it's like every new one you're like well there's probably some element of the truth to this but you know almost any time you start to take some approach where you say there's absolutes right it's all this way and it should be this one history's going to kick your butt it's going to come back and and people are going to change and they're going to realize that it, you know the absolutes don't fit everything so you have to be a bit flexible for most things that i've looked at in the past it's always like how does this relate to something we had before and what problem were they trying to solve then? And what problem were they trying to solve now? And are those the same things or are they different things? Do we actually, does this new thing have to exist? And, and that's, that's worked fairly well. Um, It's never, you know, again, it's not an absolute. It's like, oh, well, that looks like this, like service meshes look like proxies. Like, is that a proxy that you're building over here? I'm like, actually, yeah, it is. It is a lot like a proxy. Like, okay, well, like, yeah. why did proxies work really well? Why do load balancers work? Okay, well, when, when do we want to use those things? Um, in your career, What's something that you think that maybe like was one of those like bad decisions you made about like, oh, we picked a technology or we tried to implement it in a certain way that maybe wasn't the right decision? Well, I think continuing on with the, the whole purpose built databases story, that just kind of like at some point there were really valuable things. There were there were things that made sense. And um it almost got to a point where I don't know, the database leadership was like, well, we want to, we're going to create all of these pigeonholes, all of these different categories of database, and we want to check the box on every one of them. And then they continued on to like, well, there's these other uh, databases out there that we're kind of competing with. They have a different API, so let's make something compatible with that. And it blew out into this array of different options that was very hard to describe. And, and it kind of, I think, pulled away from the fundamentals of what people really needed and you know oh by the way we already have this database maybe we could build <laughs> this new thing into that database yeah. instead of creating dozens of them right and the other part of the story that i didn't really like was there was always a story where it was like we've got all of these dozens of choices and and you know you need these different things uh different query patterns for fulfilled just link five of these together and shuffle all the data back and forth between them it was like you know, that's not that easy. People make mistakes with it. Things yeah. break. And maybe we could we could take a different approach to this. So even like the whole NoSQL thing, right? I, I think there's incredible value in what DynamoDB has done. And it still has certain strengths, right? Niches that make it the best choice for certain things. But in the fullness of time, I just came to realize that this NoSQL concept was maybe more confusing than than anything because... I like to tell a story. It's like, well, if you went to someone and you asked them, hey, what kind of car do you do you have? And they answered, you know, I drive a not Camry. <laughs> That's not really like answering too much, right? A not Camry. Yeah. You know, you can say, well, this is no sequel, but there's like, I don't know how many different variations on, on that. And they're all very, very different, right? 
So I'd rather just say database. And by the way, it has these properties that maybe can solve your problem. I think your your point also on like uh, compatibility, like API compatibility with like, oh yeah, we're we're wire compatible with that other database causes so much extra confusion because you're like, oh, should I use it like that other database? And like, actually, no, not at all. <laughs> but you can send right. us the same data, right? Like that that causes so much more just forks of like, what are you actually good for? And is it ever really uh, wire compatible? Like, is it ever truly all the way there? It's never going to be. No, right? yeah. So- like there's always this edge case. Like, ah, not that one though. What what's your thought on what's your thought on um I'm now I'm blanking on the word. Um, I'm scared because when he makes that face, it's gonna be something ridiculous. No, it's it's stored procedures. Oh okay. stored procedures. Uh, those those are kind of interesting, right? Like one of the things that I saw with the Amazon teams was um they had like for the longest time totally avoided them. Right. And it was to their to their benefit in the end because they could migrate easily and everything was was great. On the flip side, though, there's, you know, sometimes a lot of reason for doing stored procedures because performance wise, you're not having to like go back and forth across the network to do these things and build it out in the client. Um, Why not simplify it? So I think it's another one of these spectrum kind of things, right? You can't, you can't take an absolute on that. Sometimes they're a really great, great idea and they're a good fit. Other times they're not. Well, that was such a, a non non controversial take on on storage procedures. <laughs> it was maybe it was kind of a non answer, right? Yeah. <laughs> <It's like, laughs> Wait, way to sidestep that one, like a good essay. <laughs> yeah, I just I'll You're just like, tiptoe well. right around the edge of that one because uh, <laughs> you know I was a bit worried. You know, going back to the fact that we rescheduled this and, and there was uh, there was time for you to really think of the tough questions. So I'm like, <laughs> all right. Well, do you have any database hot takes? Um, I guess one of them is just like the whole purpose-built database story doesn't doesn't add up anymore. The categories that they have and the way that they break things out doesn't actually make sense. I'm surprised you didn't say it was one table. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you see Pete's, table, Pete's face? He was yeah. like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. I, I, that's that's another one of the things that I think kind of took on a life of its own and everybody really wanted to it adopt really some view, view on things. And it, and it was like... Uh, over time, you just start to realize, well, you know, let's look at the reality of this. And is it really that different? And maybe you're making some poor decisions. Uh, in a lot of ways, like people are making the right decision to simplify their view of the system. But there's so yeah. many other ways that people are trying to view the system that like one table for me is good because it's my table. But once someone else wants to access it, I'm like, actually, now this sucks, right? Like there's all these like... It's- yeah, yeah, and it's like it, there is never any free lunch in databases, right? And so yeah. you look at it and you go, "Well, you could stuff everything in one table, and maybe you think that's beneficial, but let me show you why that's costing you more." Yeah, <laughs> why, like, well, I think why, it's just like yeah. it's. I don't know the way that people think that one size fits all databases are so complicated because there's so many like you have like it just goes back to the cap theorem you have to pick what's most important and then just assuming that not looking at the data and not having the context assuming that you can give one magical concept to solve all the problems and i think that's the thing with relational databases right they're really really cool they're very powerful very flexible and i think it allows developers, people who maybe haven't really thought through exactly what it means to have those acid properties. Not all of them really want to dig into that in detail, but it gives them this opportunity to make assumptions that that kind of feel intuitive and allows them to move forward more quickly. You could also take a relational database, and, you know, many of them now, there's a lot of different extensions for Postgres, and you could shard that out, right, and kind of build your own DynamoDB in a way. So the once again, there's no absolutes in any of this stuff. And, and for me, rather than getting wound around like new terms or new things that people want to, you know, sail off on, I'd rather just come back to what's what's the real problem we're, we're trying to solve here? Because so many of the fundamentals, like the more I learned about databases, the more I realized they're all the same. It's all about the storage, right? The storage and the indexes. And I don't like that it's spun out into a bazillion different options. I think I'd, I'd rather make it easier for developers to to use one interface, right? SQLite. So. Oh. <laughs> SQL. Just just use SQL, right? Because for one thing, it works from, from the whole uh, transactional end all the way into analytics. Everybody learns it. Just can make things a lot easier. Do you think that you can scale a relational database and give it like the distributed, like, same uh, kind of 
architecture as like a relational I mean, a no, non-relational database and it can still be as performant not Camry. yeah is that- <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I think i think you can right you can take postgres and and if you if you just choose to make only those very simple queries you can definitely do the same indexing and you can split things out where i would say like what dynamo db does that's still very very special even in the whole no sql space where people um you know took this shotted approach DynamoDB has like the operations side of things that they they build in a level of durability and availability that um, aren't necessarily givens if you if you configure your your own other Cassandra or something right so that it brings a little bit of ease to that and then the the whole splitting of partitions thing the level of automation that's there uh, is you don't find that in other places like I remember working Dynamo's a beast yeah I mean it's just like Here's this thing that if you have a certain simplified kind of a use case, um, you can just throw load at it, and every half hour it can double its ability to to carry extra load and double its ability to carry extra uh, storage, right? And there's no limit, right? I remember going and, and working with some customers that were maybe using a MongoDB or something. And MongoDB is interesting because it started kind of in this this NoSQL sharded approach. But then they really followed the developer side of things a lot, which mm-hmm. more power to them, right? They've yeah. had a lot of success with that. Well, I think it's also because they're they're one of the easiest databases to just throw some stuff in, and you don't have to have any background of like access modeling or schemas or they anything. Should they call it Yolo DB? It it right. is it is Yolo DB. <laughs> like no, but yeah. like honest, it's like it's one of those things where like sometimes I don't even think it's like picking the right tool. It's picking a tool that people that you employ can use and MongoDB, and they've also focused a lot on making like documentation and things friendly for people to like be able to really like get up to speed it's a lesson really to me like you know the way that they've documented things the way they've taken the hearts of developers everybody should be paying attention to that but i think it's over time that is one of their most underrated sales is the way that they help people learn how to use their products like everybody should steal that like (laughs) it is so good but the flip side is it's kind of like well, we're going to give you these really nice features that let you do these super simple queries and like, here you are, take this candy. And then like, if you actually start building around that and then you scale out, then it doesn't work quite as well with the whole totally shouted approach anymore. And it's actually the same story with relational databases, right? If you look at now you have these distributed SQL options, which are, which are super cool. The spanner, right? But there's certain operations you can make that are just very like key value, like where you can just go get a key or update a row. Those things can scale really well. But then if someone then expects they can do the really complex queries across many, many shards, there's going to be a lot of price to pay and latency and all of the back and forth across networks and things. One thing I find interesting in just infrastructure in general is like that database and storage layer has typically stayed pretty, I don't want to say closed source, but more proprietary than compute infrastructure, right? Where like getting a VM and, and running compute is pretty just generic and it's all open source stuff. But I feel like networking and databases have stayed on the, this is critical to your business. So you're going to pay for something in this realm because A, like if, right. if their data is gone, you got nothing, right? And at, at some level, yeah. like com- uh, networking just never commoditized the same way there are some commodity open source stuff but it's like a lot of work networking is really complicated like you you're either good at that yeah and there's no like mongodb of networking because you can't like make that that simple like the one of the best parts of mongodb is simplifying it so anybody can use it and networking i swear like if you're good at networking you're good at it and if you're everybody else it's like watching charlie brown's (laughs) teacher talk to you (laughs) which is also funny because like (laughs) think of think of every house that has a land Right. Like no one, they don't have databases at their house, but they all got land and they all got DNS and they all somehow connected this interconnect network network of like wireless working place. Like some people like can, they can learn that ability. And it's so fascinating to me that like that was never commoditized as much as just straight up compute has been. And then databases like there are the core open source, you know, the Postgres that are still like, yeah, no, this is fundamental. Like you should be able to do this with all these extensions. But like a lot of it is still proprietary and is still like, nah, you're going to pay someone millions of dollars 
dollars for that privilege. I think it's also because it's not sexy tech, right? Like it's not like it's hey, the stuff so critical. That, that hurts. I think it is. <laughs> well, I like databases, but how many people do you know wake up and they're like, I can't wait to become a database engineer? Like, <laughs> it's like, and it's so abstracted half of the time. You know, like how we were talking about how like cloud has made infrastructure more abstracted, so people don't always have the context. I think a lot of times databases and networking are afterthoughts and they're so abstracted away that people just depend on other people's specialties or something else to make it work and they want nothing to do with it because they're like, oh, it's too complicated. This kind of gets at something that's a little bit new for me. Like when I was on DynamoDB, there's no open source version no, of DynamoDB, no. right? There's no option there. And Same with Spanner. Or something, like there's a bu- I mean, Spanner has Cockroach right. or whatever, but like there's a lot of those, like Cosmos DB. Like there's so many clouds that have this proprietary big database that like you're just going to pay a bunch of money for. And, you know, I look, I looked at that as like, man, I, like there's no open source. And that's actually like, it's good to give people that flexibility. There were reasons why people might have wanted to have like a DynamoDB like thing on prem didn't solve that for them and i just think like enterprise db is really about like working particularly with big big companies right these are financial companies it's governments it's things like this and what's interesting to me is like when i when i moved into this product role i thought it's going to be interesting to learn about how do you balance like this open source thing but then actually have a business right and and what i've one of the realizations i had was many of these companies the people that are there are just like take my money Take my money, man. And like, this is something I don't want to manage and I want to have someone I can call, right? So, um, and that's kind of what enables us to have the engineers on our staff that we pay. You get the experts. You, you are paid for the responsibility, right? Like that's the- You get the experts and then, and then you know, they also do contribute back to the core project. Right? You know, it's like, w- what features, how do we do this? And it's, it's something that evolves over time. It's a really interesting balance to try and manage for, right? Because I can- I can see it both ways, but you really, you've really got to hit it just right so that you're not, you know, making the open source project upset with you. And you're also still being respected and and used and and having people willing to pay. So it's an interesting space, but databases are like the more I look at them, it's just, it comes back to storage, right? Like recently I was looking at like, you can do, um, you make certain choices about replication within Postgres, for example. Or you could say, well, I'm going to push this down and have like this distributed storage, block storage, a file system, right? And the reality is like, why why would you do it twice? It's kind of the same thing. It's just replication. It's making sure that the data is okay. And it is it is crucial, right? Like I had the opportunity recently to actually go in and see a data center and actually touch servers, which I had not done in a really long time. And <laughs> Did you have um, flashbacks? <laughs> Yes, I did. Very many, many scary moments, like getting paged, going into a data center, a big rack full of drives and like accidentally like grabbing the wrong one. And it's like, okay, this thing could had a RAID uh, volume that was okay if it lost one drive and I needed to replace that one. I pulled a different one, right? And now it's all dead. And it's just like that that chilling moment. The hair stands up (laughs) on the back of your neck and you know you're going to be in that data center for like the next 48 hours of your life. Yeah, watching a progress Everybody's going to hate you. (laughs) Everybody's going to hate you. Yeah, so... What did you go to the data center for? Oh, on that occasion? Yeah. It was it was just getting paged because one of the drives in this drive array had failed. But Oh no, was, this the so, new this time that you went back. Oh. The new thing is um we're actually kind of working on uh more of a a holistic platform approach for Postgres, so uh, kind of merging the transactional stuff, some of the analytics that that's happening now with with data lake houses iceberg and some of the newer formats is which is interesting to me because there's a lot of stuff that's kind of merging like that gap between transactional and analytical is getting much easier to deal with which makes me so happy <laughs> so we're we're working on on having this nice contiguous experience that you can run anywhere and one of the options will be to to run it like buy it prepackaged on hardware that you can just put in there so appliance yeah yeah so it just it was just meeting with like a, a hardware partner and and looking at what they're building and thinking about what this thing would would look like but they had they had a lab there we could go in and see all the blinky lights that made me happy it was loud yeah, yeah. it was very very loud by the way and hot um they're actually like one of the things that i saw that was was super crazy for me was water cooling 
water cooling in in compute hardware, right? And they were the talking bubbles. about two different <laughs> see it boiling, you know, the, yeah. Two two approaches where it was like one that's um, we're pumping water through these these pipe channel things and they go to the heat sinks on the CPUs, but there's this other approach where they they take the whole piece of equipment and it's submerged. Yeah. You immerse in this, it in like in an oil fluid. in it, yeah. No heat sinks or anything on it. You just bare chips and they're just bubbling away. Oh, it's that gives me anxiety because if there's like one leak, I'm just like, oh. <laughs> like, it sucks to work on. Like I've never worked in a data center that had that, but I've seen them and they're like, yeah, it sucks to like, we're here to like replace a piece on the board. You're like, you got to pull it out, dry it off, do all this stuff to like. Ah, uh, I didn't think about that. You ruined it for me, man. I was so excited. It runs warmer. Really it's cool. silent pretty much when you go in there and you're just like, wow, it's like, it's like 85 in here, 85 Fahrenheit. Like this is kind of warm and like, where's the fans? Like what's going on right now? And it's just, it's <laughs> weird. Yeah. Yeah. Things are changing so much. So much. It's great. They're talking about building databases under the water, but not database data, center, data centers underneath the water. It's crazy what they're going to do to be able to support the amount of compute power that we're going to need for AI. Yeah. Well, we like hurricanes and, data and boiling the water is one way to get more hurricanes. So <laughs> it's like this is like the beginning of a horror movie with the before times before you ruin things. <laughs> like, uh, well, some of that's kind of been going on for a while, right? Like yeah. where where they choose to maybe it was Intel, different companies Microsoft had chosen for a while. They had like a submerged and yeah. chosen to locate their big data centers like in places where the electricity is cheaper. Right. Well, These kinds I mean, of decisions. Washington and Oregon, so. like that's why like US East or West 2 is where it is because it was cheap power, nice cooling. And I know Facebook has white papers about like putting their data centers in Arctic zone areas. We're like, hey, guess what? Like it's we just open the windows yeah. and it cools things down. Like that's amazing. <laughs> like, uh, maybe maybe that's not I don't know. Like it's good, good business decision. Yeah, <laughs> but like um, it's always like, are you raising that like environmental heat it's yeah. i don't know there's yeah there's always a price to be paid yeah. right no free like, lunch. You, you know um like you, you see some of this stuff that's proposed about like underwater uh, power generation and those kinds of things and i'm a diver i'm like i like to <laughs> dive there i don't know you're you're not going to let people like dive in and swim through these big turbines right not just that, but like, please don't break the world for us. Sometimes we want to go outside. Like, <laughs> like, can we not ruin the forest and the ocean? Because I think it's really pretty. <laughs> yeah, these will be these will be more things that, like, you know, ten years from now, when I have a lot more gray, and you guys are on, like, I don't know, episode number of, number of whatever, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be looking back on some of this stuff and going, "Oh, this was a bad idea." <laughs> some of these things, it seemed good at the time. Is there anything during your long career that you're like, this is a horrible idea? And then everybody was like, it's great. And you were like, it's horrible. And it turned out to indeed be horrible because I feel like you've probably, like, with as many things that happen over and over and over again, and it's all the same, I feel like it's got to be wild having your type of experience because you're probably just like, this, we're doing this again. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, and this, I don't know if this is a, a popular opinion or not, but I, I look at like AI and a lot of the stuff that's happening around there, there's a ton of hype around it. And to me, it feels a little bit like the early days of the internet. And, and it seems like it's cool. There's going to be something neat that comes out of that, but it's a little bit selective, right? But it's going to be bazillions of dollars and so much effort expended on it. And most of it's just going to fall aside and not really mean much in time. I think you still have to do that. I mean, I saw the the Gartner report just recently. I read it. It was from July that like thirty percent of AI projects will will be retired by twenty twenty six, and I'm like, this is great news. Wow, twenty twenty six. Thirty per thirty percent by <laughs> they said by the end of twenty twenty five. I'm like, awesome. Like, let's go. Like this, I'm I am ready for it. Let's figure out what what's noise and what's uh what's actually usable. Well, I mean, back to, back to the whole thing of like this this bazillion different database options. It's kind of like when that was, stuff was going on. I was like, everybody's building a vector database. Yeah, everybody like they're all over the place. And it's like, so you're creating this new database category. And, you know, where's the data going to come from? It's going to come from your transactional database. Yeah. Why don't you just make this a new index? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Even Cassandra's asset now it has it can do asset transactions. So it's like what you were saying about how transactional and analytics and stuff. It's like they're trying to do so much of both. It's interesting where this is all going to go. Pete, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're going to get rid of me now. I've talked too much. No, this has been fantastic. I love this conversation. <laughs> but I actually, we don't ever do changelog plus plus stuff like an after the show. We've already been going for over an hour. Can you explain vector databases to me in the plus plus portion of this episode? 
because I've asked so many times and oh, no one can, can give me a good, <laughs> good answer. Pete's like, this is a and lot no, of pressure. It's <laughs> and no, it's okay. It's like, I know what a, I, I know what a, you know, like a graph database is. And everyone's like, it's a graph database with direction. And I'm like, that tells me nothing. I'm willing to give you my spin on it. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent confident. It's, it's accurate, but it's the way that I think about it. So everyone, thank you, uh, Pete, for coming on. If you are a plus plus subscriber, stick around. We'll have a few more minutes of, of what Pete's spin of vector database is. And maybe this will be a clip somewhere. I don't know. I don't ever do plus plus content, but I think it's a great topic because I want to learn more. So thanks everyone for coming and we'll talk to you again soon. Three, two, one. Thanks for listening to Ship It with Justin Garrison and Autumn Nash. Subscribe now if you haven't already. Head to shipit.show for all the ways or just search for Ship It wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find us. Thanks once again to our partners at fly.io to the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder for these dope beats and to Sentry. Use code changelog when you sign up and save a hundred bucks off their team plan. That's all for now, but come back next week when we continue discussing everything that happens after Git Push.